Well, it's uh, fantastic to be with you at Berry Christian Fellowship. Uh, I was hoping to be with you physically, uh, but we're unable to do that because of the pandemic. So here we are virtually connecting with each other. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Mark. I'm married to Alison. Uh, we have two daughters, three granddaughters. Uh, I'm a Hull City supporter. I love really good coffee and I'm passionate about travel and in particular I'm passionate about most things Italian. I also lead something called Passion for Jesus uh, or PFJ for short. We're a global movement of around about 200 churches that are connecting together. And I was thinking about a prophetic word we'd been given and it was at a time when we'd actually been in 36 nations. And along comes this friend of ours who's a prophet who happened to say, you'll be in 36 nations in a two year period. I have to say, my heart sank. Um, I knew some of the costs of being in 36 nations in 19 years. I knew the hard work, I knew the sacrifice, I knew some of the heartache, some of the pain. Uh, I also knew uh, some of the financial pressures of seeing that kind of vision fulfilled as well. Uh, but I did what we're taught to do in scripture. I took the prophecy away, I weighed it. And the more I weighed it and prayed about it, the more convinced I was that God was speaking to us. And so I went to our team, I said, I really believe God's in this. Uh, and so let's go for it and let's trust him. And so last July, we set about the first of those 36 new nations. One of our teams, Silvano Chilembwe, who leads one of our churches, he uh, went across to Mozambique and uh, started making some fresh connections for us in that nation. And we got up to March of this year and we'd already reached into eight new nations. And then the pandemic hit. And so, of course, I'm thinking, how on earth does this equate with a pandemic? It was like my diary went from being full to being empty overnight and uh, things were very, very quiet for us on one level up until around July time. And then July time, we started to see a change happening. Uh, doors started to open, new connections started to be made. Uh, and since uh, July time, we've connected and ministered in over 18 new nations. And we just know that even though physically we can't go many places and we're in lockdown, there is no lockdown in the kingdom of God. There is a breakout that is upon us at this time. And I just got a very simple message this morning that I hope will inspire some faith to arise uh, for you to believe, for God to take hold of you as a church and to take hold of you as individuals and use you in a way that he's never used you before to see lives touched and changed in and around the area of Bury. Scripture I want to take is found in Ecclesiastes and it's Ecclesiastes 4 verse 12 and it says this and if one can overpower him who is alone two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. Other versions say a cord of three strands cannot easily be broken. I don't know what you think about this scripture, but it's a scripture that very often is used at weddings. Usually it's that idea of a man and a woman with God in the middle making covenant together. Uh, and the proclamation is made that a cord of three strands 
if you've got God in the middle, it cannot easily be broken. But I want us to see this morning that God has given us three strands in mission. That when we put those strands into the life of a church, into a life of a movement, those strands cannot easily be broken. They are these three things. The word, good works and signs and wonders. The first thing is the word. You know, I believe at times we underestimate the power of God's word. After all, when God spoke at the beginning of the time, he took something that was void and without form and he created the universe that we find ourselves in. The Bible tells us that heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will remain tells us in scripture that we are born again of the incorruptible seed of God's word. And so there is something in eternal, unchanging, unstoppable about the spoken word of God. I really believe that God's word in our mouths is as powerful as God's word in his mouth. I heard this story a few years ago uh, about a Ugandan pastor who was on his way to Entebbe Airport. And if you've ever been to Entebbe Airport, you'll know that there is a road that leads up to the airport and there are police and army checks on that road. And you have to pull the vehicle across to one side. You have to get out of the vehicle. They want to search your person. They also want to search the vehicle. And what they're doing is they're looking for bombs, they're looking for guns, they're looking to see if you've got some kind of terrorist connection. Well, this Ugandan pastor, he comes up to the road check. He gets out of the car and he turns to the army personnel and he says the following things. He says, when you look in that car, you will find the most powerful weapon in all the universe. I don't know what he was playing at. I mean, that's the most ludicrous thing to say to army people. They're immediately interested in what's going on. They're not just giving it the simple once over. They're going through this vehicle thoroughly. And as they go through it thoroughly, they come back to the pastor and they say, we've looked all over your vehicle and we cannot find this weapon that you're talking about. And so he goes into his vehicle, he opens the glove box, he gets his Bible out, he holds his Bible up and he says, Sir, that is the most powerful weapon in the universe. You know, the Word of God has incredible power. It has the power to change and transform people's lives. It has the power to release you into the destiny and the call that God has placed upon you. He makes promises to us and he stays faithful to those promises. I remember a few years ago I was ministering in the country of Estonia and uh, we had a, actually an incredible time there. It's one of the few occasions when I've been traveling where I almost felt as though I would get on the phone to Alison and say, you'll have to come across to Estonia because we're seeing a move of God break out amongst us. And on the Sunday morning, I was preaching the simple gospel as salvation and healing. Uh, but my voice, uh, was t I was tired, my voice was under strain, uh, and I started to lose the volume in it. And I was whispering out this message. I mean, there was just no volume, no authority in my voice whatsoever. Uh, I often th think if that was recorded, uh, what did it sound like? But I just proclaimed the gospel. I still declared the fact that Jesus Christ saves and heals. And there was a woman there and she was unable to move her right arm. She'd suffered a stroke. But as she sat 
uh, in the congregation and heard the gospel being preached, faith rose up within her and she started to stretch her arm, move her arm around about. At the end of the message, she came forward to the platform to share the testimony of what happened, all the symptoms of the stroke that she'd had, all the problems that she'd had, had all been healed instantaneously. No one had prayed for her. No one had laid hands on her. Just the simple word of God went out and healing came into her life. Even during this lockdown period where we've been unable often to pray with people and lay hands on people, even as we proclaim the word over the internet, we found many people to experience healing in their lives. You know, the word of God is powerful. And I believe this is a time for us to get fresh confidence in the gospel, to get fresh confidence in what God has declared, to allow his word to go out and to change and transform people's lives. Second area that I believe we need is we need good works. I don't know if you've ever noticed that doing good can be really hard work. Uh, one of the things that we do as a ministry is uh, we obviously put uh, a lot of support into the lives of those that are in the developing world. Sometimes they are the poorest of the poorest who have no access to bank accounts. And so we have to use the different money transfer uh, companies that are out there. And one of the companies we were using was Western Union. And everything was going fine until one day I got a phone call. And this phone call said, uh, Yo, are you Mark Curtis? I said, Yes. Uh, and we went through a few things. Uh, they then started to go through the list of people that we'd sent money to. And they asked me, do you know this person? I said, yes, I know that person. I've visited them in their home. Uh, I've been to their country. I know who they are. They're a long-standing friend. And it went on and on and on. About half an hour, this wasn't an interview. It was an interrogation that was taking place. At the end of the half hour interrogation, they said, we just need to go away for a minute. We'll come back to you if you just hold the line. So I held the line. They came back to me. They said, from this day onwards, you'll not be able to use Western Union again. I, I, I said to him, I said, do you suspect us of money laundering, of uh, terrorist links? Is that what you're telling me? And they said, well, yeah, we, we do actually. I said, but I said, we're a United Kingdom registered charity. I said, there's an audit trail for everything we do. Uh, I said, we give accounts into the Charity Commission and uh, the re revenue uh, and customs as well. I said, everything we do is legitimate and above board. I said, all we are simply trying to do is do good in people's lives and you're preventing us from doing that. <clears throat> I discovered that day that doing good can sometimes be hard work. And do you know why doing good is hard work? I believe it is hard work because every act of goodness, I believe, is a declaration of war. Every act of goodness is a declaration of war against the powers of darkness. You see, Acts 10.38 says this, that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, who went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Everything that Jesus ever did was good, and every act of goodness was also a declaration of war. I love the story of the man with the withered hand who comes to Jesus on the Sabbath. And if you read it uh, in the message version, it just takes away a little bit of the religiosity we sometimes have in our thinking. Because there is Jesus being confronted by the religious leaders of the day who do not like the fact that he goes around doing good on the Sabbath. 
And so they're waiting to trip him up. They're waiting to corner him. And they see this man with the withered hand and they're waiting to pounce because they know the moment he heals that man that he has broken the Sabbath and they can pounce on him. And I love the fact that Jesus is willing to break the laws in order to do good in people's lives. You know, in the church of Jesus Christ, I believe that we should be known for goodness. I believe everywhere we go, we should be going around doing good. I believe acts of random kindness belong to the church of Jesus Christ. I believe that the gospel has a social element to it, that we're in the business of building community. We're in the business of building relationships. We're in the business of restoring hope to those who are lonely, those who are marginalized, those who feel as though they're on the outside looking in. We're in the business of helping those who are poor. We're in the business of taking the downtrodden and lifting them up and putting dignity into their lives. We're in the business of saying the old matter and they matter greatly to God. We're in the business of saying that no one is too young to be involved in this life-changing revolution that Jesus Christ has unleashed in the earth. And I believe it's time for the church to be known for goodness. Sadly, over the years, we've often been known for being too narrow. We've been known for, for being miserable. We've been known for being harsh and judgmental. But I believe something new is happening in the church of Jesus Christ. And people are discovering that mercy triumphs over judgment. People are discovering that the grace of God leads people to say no to ungodliness. And it is time in the church for us to be known as for our goodness. You know, there was a lady, Dorcas or Tabitha, uh, who was known for goodness. She took care of the poor in her city. And then we read that her, she died uh, and then she was raised back from the dead. And in the midst of that story, what we actually discover is this, that a town turns to God. You know, there is something powerful about good works. We don't do good uh, as, as a means to an end. We don't do good to to try and convert people and proselytize people we do good because we believe in goodness we do good because we believe the kingdom of god is a kingdom of righteousness and justice we do good because the god we know and the god we love wants to do good in people's lives and so let's start to spread the goodness of God in Bury, the surrounding areas. Let's unleash a new virus in Bury called the virus of kindness, the virus of compassion, the virus of mercy, and the virus of goodness. The third thing that I believe we need is we need signs and wonders. You know, the God we serve is a supernatural God. The gospel we preach is a supernatural gospel. Romans 1.16, Paul says this, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. You know, we believe in the gospel because it is powerful. And we believe it is the power of God unto salvation. That word salvation is the Greek word sozo, which actually means wholeness, completeness. In other words, God is interested in every part of our being. He's not just interested in our spirit, but he is interested in our soul. 
which is the seed of our emotions and our mind. He's interested in our physical body. He's interested in our relationships. And I believe he is a supernatural God who brings supernatural change. I remember uh, a few years ago, I was asked to... Uh, uh, do a healing meeting. It was with a church plant over in Lincolnshire. Uh, and it was one of the most bizarre uh, evenings I think I've ever been involved in. Uh, the leader of the church plant was a South African guy. Uh, he was your classic South African, very straight talking kind of guy. And uh, he was a bit of a wheeler dealer. He liked a bargain or two. And so he uh, was at a motorway service station and he bumped in uh, to this guy. And this guy said to him, would you like to buy a suit? And so there at this motorway service station, he buys these six Italian suits for £200. He thinks he's got an absolute bargain. And these suits he has bought for the six leaders in this church plant. The only problem is it's six uniform suits. And of course, these leaders are not uniform in their size. Some are tall and thin. Some are short and round and stocky. Uh, some are a little bit average and in between. And so you can imagine the scene. He insists that they all wear a, a suit that he's bought for them at this healing meeting. And so we turn up and some look like Tom Hanks on uh, Big. And then others, you, you know, the, the suits, they are popping out of the suit. They're like the Incredible Hulk about to break out. Absolutely ridiculous scene. I'm so glad that the gospel is bigger than our foolishness and the ridiculous things that we get up to. And that night, as the gospel was preached, there was a lady by the name of Gladys who gave her life to Jesus Christ. And so she gets saved. And then we gave an appeal for healing and she comes forward for healing. She's got glaucoma. She's unable to see out of her eyes. She's prayed for. Nothing seems to happen. She goes and she sits back down in a chair. And then I love genuine healings because there's always an outburst of joy and suddenly whilst all the religious activity is going on here is this lady shouting out from the middle of the church gathering I can see I can see I can see she picks up a bible she's able to read for the first time in months she's been instantly healed by Jesus Christ you know, she got saved, she got healed. And the last sight I had of Gladys that night was she was busy laying hands on people for them also to be healed. So she was saved, healed and discipled in one go. You know, a three-chord strand cannot be easily broken. It's time for us to see the miraculous more and more in the church. Ever there was a time where people are crying out for the supernatural. It is now. It's time, I believe, for us to move in signs and wonders. The unusual happenings of God. The things that make your head scratch. The things that ask, make you ask questions. What on earth was that about? Why did that happen? And yet they point to the reality of who Jesus Christ is. I believe this is a time and a season for the church to awake, to arise to our call and our destiny in God and for us to do extraordinary things. Ephesians reminds us that God is able to do far more than we can ask, think or imagine. I love the fact that it invites us to imagine. I want to encourage you to start imagining. I want to encourage you to just sit in your chair 
have some quiet space and time with God and start to dream, start to imagine. You know, every miracle, I believe, starts in the place of imagination. It starts in the place of dreaming. It starts in stepping in to the invisible, unknown world. You know, what faith simply does is it takes of heaven, it takes of the unseen, and it brings it down into the earth. And this is a time for us all to arise. You know, Scripture says these signs shall follow not the apostle, not the prophet, not the evangelist, not the pastor, the teacher, says these signs shall follow those who believe. I'm just going to pray a simple prayer now. Maybe you're suffering from some kind of sickness at this time. I want you to just simply lay hands on yourself where you are, and I will pray a simple prayer, believing for God to heal and restore. So just put your hand on your head, even now. Father, I just want to thank you that you know everyone's situation. And Lord, we take authority over sickness and over disease, and we command it to go in Jesus' name. And Lord, we release your healing power and your healing anointing even now. And we pray, Lord, that you will back and confirm your word with signs and with wonders in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for Berry Fellowship. And thank you, Lord, for all that has been invested in the town of Bury during this pandemic time. And Lord, I just want to pray now that the fellowship will grow in influence. I pray you will open new doors. You'll create new opportunities. You'll give a fresh favour. And I pray, Lord, that your gospel will reach out even more into the town of Bury. And we bless the fellowship. We bless Barry today. We say, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for listening. Uh, I keep track of you on, on Facebook, obviously. Uh, and we bump into one or two of you from time to time. And so... We just want you to know we love you and we appreciate you uh, and you're doing a great work as a church and just keep on being faithful to Jesus. God bless you. Amen.